All right, I have this question here from Dami. And Dami is asking, how can a believer live a life that suits God in this era of capitalism? And this is a question that Dami um, asked me after listening to a podcast I did a while back called The F Word, What Would Jesus Do? If you've not listened to it, I would encourage you to listen to it. It would give some context to answering Dami's question. So Dami is asking, how can a believer um, live a life that pleases God in this era of capitalism? Now, in the previous podcast I've done, um, the F word, what would Jesus do? I expressed my concern about the present day attitude of Christians and the, um, their disposition towards putting profit over people. Just like what is done in capitalist economy, where everyone is seen as a business target. So the first thing you think about when you see someone is what can you sell for th- to them and how can you get into their pockets. And if they don't have anything in their pockets, you really don't want to have anything to do with them. So in a capitalist environment, the um, profit is the order of the day. It is a society that is run solely on profit made by personal business practices. Now, there's nothing wrong with business, but the thing that I have a problem with is putting people or profit over people. I believe this strongly goes against the values that Jesus Christ gave us as believers. So I truly believe that believers should live above capitalism. And believers should not put profit over people. But what Dami is asking here, if if believers should live above trade, good for trade, doing good for money, in exchange of money, then how does the believer survive? How does the believer survive? If that is what pleases God, an attitude of freely giving, of free giving, an attitude of empathy and love that drives us to a point where we can freely give, then how do we as believers make money to survive? How do we afford the basic things that we need like food, shelter, and clothing. So Dami's question is, how does a believer survive? How does a believer make it through this world without adopting a capitalist mentality of constant trade? Now, to answer Dami's question, I want to talk about a movie called The Matrix. In 1999, the Wachowski brothers released a movie called The Matrix. Now, this movie redefined the movie industry. It redefined the movie industry in a way that I don't think any other movie has done till date, especially when it comes to special effects. I remember watching this movie in 1999 and it totally blew my mind. I'd never seen a movie like that before. The special effects were out of this world. Out of this world. Groundbreaking. It kind of paved way for a new era of sci-fi movies and what could be done in terms of special effects. Now, the thing about The Matrix is that it was not just an enthralling movie to watch because of the special effects. It also had a great storyline. So I'm going to give you kind of a synopsis of the movie and I'm, not going to, I'm going to try not to spoil it for those that haven't watched it. But then I will spoil it a little bit. So if you've not watched The Matrix, you might not want to listen to this and just go and watch The Matrix. But then if you've watched it, I'll just give you like a reminder course on, on it. But then even if I tell you the outcome of the movie, Um, The truth of the matter is it's still going to be a very interesting movie for anybody, even if you know what's going to happen. Is that enthralling in terms of special effects? 
But the movie is basically about a man called Neo, played by Keanu Reeves. Now, it is set in this dystopian era where the world is being it's highly technological and um, human beings have been hijacked by machines by artificial intelligence the movie is way beyond beyond this time um but then it's it captures a scenario where human beings have been captured by this machine and it has put human beings in a state of sleep and is harvesting human beings as a source of energy to power the machine so the human beings are trapped in something called the matrix now there is this character called neo who happens to be the chosen one who is meant or destined to deliver humans from the stranglehold of this machine and bring everybody to a state of awareness. Now, by some means, Neo gets to meet a group of people that convince him because even Neo was in a state of, you know, a state of sleep before it was broken, where he where he didn't know what was going on. So he was living this simulated life that wasn't real. But he met these people that kind of broke his sleep and told him, this is who you are. This is what you're meant to do. This life that you're living is a fake life. It doesn't really exist. This is your real life. And um, Neo is awakened and they told him, you are the one that is meant to stop this machine, defeat this machine, and wake the world up. So you are the chosen one. So he meets this set of people. One of them is called um, is a lady called Trinity, and there is a leader called Morpheus. Now Morpheus is very intent on Neo doing his job as the chosen one. At first, he's skeptical as to whether Neo is the chosen one or not, but he's very intent on Neo fulfilling this prophecy. So he does all he can to train Neo to fight the opposition. Now, the opposition are this group of things. I think they are programs, computer codes, but they are called agents. They are men dressed in suits, and they are very powerful. Morpheus and his team have been trying to fight these people for years, and they've not been able to defeat them because they are so powerful. And it is Neo who is destined to fight them. So what Morpheus tries to do is train Neo to fight and to, to, number one, to identify them, number two, to combat them. So he's taken through some pretty rigorous fighting um, exercise. So he goes through a lot of training with Morpheus. They invest a lot of time training him to be the chosen one. But what happens every time when Neo encounters these agents who are the evil guys is that they always get beaten. By some means, they get beaten. As in, it, it doesn't even seem to be much of a fight for the agents. They get beaten, Neo gets beaten, and they have to retreat every single time from the agents. And this upsets Morpheus. He's like, what's going on? If this guy is the chosen one, and we've trained him in all these styles of fighting, why can he not defeat these people? And every time they go and go on a mission to try to follow the plans of the machine, the agents show up and they have to retreat with their tails in between their legs. And so decided to doubt whether or not Neo was actually the chosen one. But then it was always confirmed that Neo was the chosen one. There was um, a lady, I can't remember her name, but she seemed to be the seer who saw everything. So she, want, she was the one that had the insight. And she always confirmed that you didn't make a mistake. Neo is the chosen one. He's the one that is meant to defeat this machine. But this always upset Morpheus. How can he be the chosen one? When we keep losing people, in fact, people die every time we go and fight. 
And we always have to be the one to protect Neo, to stop the agents from killing him. So, so Morpheus was always caught in this circle of sending Neo, going into battles with Neo, but ending up coming back to protect and to, to get Neo away from the agents. So Neo didn't seem to him like a chosen one. So there was one particular fight or one particular mission that they went on. And as usual, the agents were overpowering Morpheus, Neo, and the rest of the crew. And as usual, they made a hasty retreat. But in retreating this time, they left Neo behind. Neo couldn't re retreat with them. And then Neo was cornered by the agents. And then it seemed like it was the end of Neo. This guy cannot be the chosen one. He's cornered. He's definitely going to die. And so he got into a fight with the um, leader of the agents. And um, very easy fight. The leader killed him. Killed Neo. And Neo was dead. And at that point in the movie, you're like, how can this guy be the chosen one? He's dead. He's dead. The guy that, is, that was chosen to defeat the machine is dead. But at that point, this seems to be the standout part of the movie. Neo comes back to life. He comes back to life. Uh, but he comes back to life a new person. The look on his face is different. His attitude is different. And when he comes back to life, the agent looks at him surprised, thinking, I just killed this guy. This guy should not be coming back to life. So he goes back in to try to fight with him and kill him again. But then in fighting with him, he saw that he was fighting with a different person in terms of his ability to fight. Neo was fighting effortlessly, even without looking at the agent. And before you knew it, he defeated the agent. And now it was now the other agents that had to retreat hastily from this new human being that was born, that they couldn't understand who this person was. And at that point, Neo became the chosen one. Now, why am I going over this movie called The Matrix? Because The Matrix in itself tells us something about life. The Matrix in itself tells us something the Bible has been trying to tell us for years. And this actually is the answer to Dami's question. How does a, a believer survive in this era of capitalism? If the believer is meant to give himself freely without leaning on trade, how does he survive? The believer survives by dying. The believer survives by dying. The Bible tells us very clearly, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it can never bear fruit. Never. For a seed to reach its ultimate potential, for a seed to do what it has been made and created to do, it must first of all die. Dying is essential for life. The Bible says this in so many ways. It says, he who tries to save his life will lose it. But he who gives up his life will find it. The secret to living as a believer in today's world is dying. Until Neo was cornered, was cornered to die, he would never have become the chosen one. What, what made Neo the chosen one wasn't his preparation, wasn't his fight preparation, wasn't the amount of practice he was having with Morpheus. What made him what converted him into the one that was chosen to defeat the machine was because he was the one that was chosen to die. Death was the activator of life for Neo, 
For him to live as the chosen one, he had to die as Neo. And what am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say here is that we must stop trying to survive. Stop trying to survive. Every time we try to survive, as believers, we remove God's hand from our lives. God is a jealous God. He doesn't like to share glory with anybody. God cannot be holding the spoon in the kitchen and we also have our spoon stirring the pot with him. God wants us to be truly surrendered. It's in truly surrendering that we will find out God's ultimate plan for us. God's ultimate plan for provision for us. It's in taking our hands off the preservation of our lives and our sustenance that God's ability to sustain begins to gush into our lives. But the problem is that we haven't. We live life 50-50. At best, 50-50. Sometimes surrendered, other times hustling. And when we live life 50-50, we get no results. No results. It's not even a matter of we get 50% results. You get no results. You are either in or out. It's all or nothing. So living life 50-50 means if you take a seed and put it in the floor, and during the day you rip it out, and at night you go back and put it in, and the next day when morning comes again, you rip it out and hold it in your hand so that it doesn't, the ants don't get to it and it doesn't begin to decay. And at night you put it back in, in again. That seed will not come up with half a tree. It will come up with no tree, no fruit, until you put that seed in the ground and let it break up and let some ants get to it and eat the flesh around it and let it die, that the roots begin to take, the roots begin to go down. You must leave it in the ground. You must commit it to the ground. It must die. The believer must die to self, to live in God. It's the dying. But believers are scared to die. Because we have the mafios in our lives that tries to keep us alive. So when you watch The Matrix, the biggest enemy of Neo wasn't the agent. It was Morpheus. Morpheus was the one always coming to save him from dying. And as long as Morpheus came to save him from dying, he would never fulfill the prophecy of being the chosen one. Some of you, the reason why you've, ne you've not seen exponential growth in your life, in your finances, in your status, is because you still have that job called Morpheus in your life. The job that represents Morpheus, that saves you, that comes and takes your seed out the ground and hustles, then puts your seed back to ground at night. Until there's nothing to save you but God, you will never see the full hand of God. Never. And I'm going to try to bring this home so it doesn't sound so abstract. You see, this is something I learned personally. If you listen to one of my podcasts where I talked about um, commitment, I talked about commitment and I, and I, I I said in that podcast that I, I really felt God was telling me to be more committed to this act of podcasting, which is a free service, free, free value. If you're ever getting value from Pro Masterclass, it's free. It's free. You can share it with as many people as possible. 
comes at no cost. It comes at a personal cost to me. I pay for the data. I pay for, you know, everything. I pay for my equipment, the mic. But you listen to it for free. And I aim to keep it that way. It takes a lot of dying to do this. I do this every single day. That is the dying. But until I committed myself to it, as a seed commits itself to the ground, to do this and to give it out for free, I didn't start to see God's hand, his mighty hand. The mighty hand of God that proved to me that God doesn't need my work or my hustle to provide for me. It was a scary thing to do. Close down my business, my design business. Just closed it down. I wasn't doing that business anymore. I decided I was going to fully dive into this thing, which was a full act of self-service. No profit. And I said, God, prove yourself. If your word says, die, then here I am, killing the scheme, the scheming, strategic business part of Tola that takes care of himself by day, even though he might surrender to you by night, that has a backup plan. I'm giving it up to you. And I did that this year. I said, no, I will not go out and hustle and look for business. I will commit to this thing and see how life would come. And the truth of the matter is that God has amazed me in ways I never thought. I've had more income this year of dying than I have had in my past 19 years of doing business. This year is my 20th year as a business person and I decided to stop business this year. And God showed me That in this year of giving up and retiring at a young age from the hustle and planning for your future by working in a capitalist way, I will bless you in a spiritual way. And I will show you that without your hustle, with you being fully committed to an act of service that is free, I will bless you. And God has done it. He has done it. I do not, see, I do not, I do not go out and advertise myself. I have people call me and tell me, come and do this for us. Come and do this for us. We are ready to pay you this. We are ready to pay you this amount. I've had people just transfer money to me. Just tell me, I just, I'm just thinking about you have this money. I've had people transfer money to members of my family, which is where I want to touch on. The problem is a lot of us have four faulty family structures where we run autonomous families. Every every member of the family runs an autonomous life. So they live for themselves. Everyone has their money. The children have their money. The husband has his money. The wife has her money. Everybody's money is separate. You see, you will never see God's hand if you run such a family system. One of the things I realized is that when I gave up the business and leaned fully into the mission of giving freely, my gifts and my services, my talent, when I gave it to God totally without asking or having a business model, or making profit from it. God started releasing different avenues of blessings. Sometimes it might just be my children. God just sends someone to my children and just sends them money. But because we run an integrated family system, 
It is not my children's money. It is the family's money. We live such a life that all our resources come at come to the table. We join them and we mix them up together. There's nothing that is daddy's own and mommy's own and the kid's own. Everything that comes into the family is a blessing to all. So I see God blesses us sometimes through our children. Someone will just favor our children and say, you know what? I'm giving this to the children. When you give to the children, you give to us, the family. Sometimes it's true, my wife. My wife will just say, oh, I just received this alert. Someone just said, I should have this. Give to the family. Sometimes it's to me directly. Someone just say, oh, come, speak to us here. Oh, this is what we have for you. Sometimes they'll ask, what would you want us to give to you? And I tell them, a lot of times I tell them, what do you have? What do you use your budget? And sometimes they just tell us anything. It is not a haggling. I don't haggle. I don't haggle. Unlike when I was doing business, when I used to tell them what I would want to have straight up from the beginning of the conversation, they will always argue. No, we can't give you this. No, it's too much. No, it's that. And the work comes with a lot of labor, sometimes some disagreement, sometimes some, some very troublesome clients. Sometimes they don't appreciate how much work is done. Sometimes the profit is not enough. Sometimes they are holding off to your balance payment. You go back asking them, I'm free from all those things. And God is faithful. God has been faithful. I am a living example that you can give freely. And it will not affect your life in terms of what comes in. As a matter of fact, it will make your life better. But we are scared to die. Just like Morpheus was scared of Neo to die. He didn't understand that allowing Neo to die is what would release the chosen one. Sometimes you just need to take that experiment and just say, I'm going to try this out. For the next six months, I will give freely and I will see whether I will die. I will give freely and I will see whether really I won't be able to come up with that rent. I will give freely and I will see really whether I won't be able to meet up with this payment that I usually make. Test God and see. A lot of us say we trust God, but we still lean on our own schemes, our understanding, our plan, our strategies. And I told you, God is a jealous God. He wants all, all the glory. So when he does it, you won't say, hmm, it was a little bit of God and my strategy and stuff. No, you would know it was totally God. How does a Christian or a believer survive, live a life that suits God in an era of capitalism? He does it by surrender, total surrender. When you totally surrender and you put people above all else, God will put your matter above all else. He will settle everything that concerns you. Life, nature in itself, doesn't watch its creation die. Nature always has a way of stepping in. It steps in. As long as it's not your time, it will step in. It always has a way of stepping in. To the one that is well positioned by surrendering, who is where it's made. The one that is where it's meant to be. Where it's meant to be. A lot of times it's our strategy that puts us where we shouldn't be. Doing what we shouldn't be doing. With people we shouldn't be with. Strategy. So the simple answer to the question. How do you live a life that pleases God? Is by not being scared to die. Testing God with your life and saying, I'm willing to lose my life for this. And you realize that God will not let you lose your life. How did Abraham gain his son? By being ready to lose him. When God said, give your son to me. He was ready to give up his son. And by being ready to give up his son, he got more sons. 
more than he could ever imagine from generation to generation over many nations. But you must be ready to give up that which we hold on to tightly. That which seems so important. That which seems that when we give up, it will break our hearts. When you're ready to do that to God, or do that for God, God will go all out on everything that concerns you. Man doesn't need work to survive. Man needs God to survive. And I hope that makes sense to you, Dami, and to any other person listening today. Take God by his word. Put your seed in the ground and decide you're not going to take it up again. Watch it die and realize that it doesn't truly die. It becomes a mighty tree that has fruit. That's how nature works. And that is God's plan for the believer.